Good morning. Welcome to the last lecture of this course, Supervised Learning 2. Today we have sort of a random brain dump of things that I just want to put on your radar that we won't really have time to go into fully, but um, needs, need to be said or at least mentioned. Uh, so that's kind of the, the later part, um, but first we'll do some CNN stuff and some stuff related to the lab. So first, just some summarizing of what we talked about last time. Last time was the very low-level, detail-oriented introduction to convolutional neural networks. Um, I think you got some of the high-level stuff in the video, but just wanted to recap. The high level is when you have these kind of signal-based inputs, so uh, time series, audio series, images, videos, all these kinds of things, then if you just tried to flatten the thing into a vector, A, you would be throwing away information about the structure, B, you would have way too many parameters, which would lead to overfitting, computational problems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so these convnets make sort of a simplifying assumption that we can just look at things locally in a little window. And if we learn a filter, that filter is going to be useful in this part of the image and this part of the image. Or that 1D filter will be useful in this part of the time series and that part of the time series. Because we're kind of sliding it around the whole signal and reusing it everywhere. Uh, just terminology, so all these things are the same. Convolutional neural network, convolutional network, convolutional net, convnet, and CNN. You may hear all of those terms out in the wild. Um, and yeah, a bunch of you, this, this caused some problems last time, this whole thing of a convolutional net is a special case of a fully connected network because convolution is a, is a matrix multiplication and here's the matrix, all these zeros, blah, blah, blah. Um, as I said last time, I think it's good for you to know and that can give you confidence that all the tricks we learned can still be applied like all this gradient stuff, regularization stuff, whatever it is, we can kind of transfer everything over to the convnet world. But I think it's actually unhelpful to think that way too much. Um, and I prefer to think more the way we were thinking on Monday, which is just the data shape way of thinking. What is the shape going in? What is the shape going out? Why? Et cetera, et cetera. OK. Um, and then just the sort of story of convnets. So uh, this idea, I, I just wanted to share with you that they, that you're kind of hierarchically getting more and more abstract. So you may have heard people talk about this, like the first layer detects edges, and the second layer detects curves, and the third layer, if you're, if you're trying to tell if something's a cat or a dog, I don't know, the third layer detects like the, the head shape or whatever, and by the end you have some features that are really useful in telling if it's a cat or a dog. So I think it's good to hear that story. I think there is some truth to it. Um, after you've done the fitting, you can actually look at the filters that were learned in the first layer. And they do often look like edge detectors and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, it's just a story. And uh, we don't really know, or it's very hard for us to know what's going on inside of these networks. So any questions, lingering questions on us? Uh, is it possible to have constraints on our filters to, so that we can particularly learn like edges and stuff like that? Is it possible to have constraints on our filters so that we can particularly learn edges and stuff like that? Well, there's a few answers. First of all, you could just do feature engineering yourself before you start, like you talked about in 573, and feed those features in. Um, but people don't usually do that. The other thing that is sort of analogous to what you're asking is actually what you do in lab with these pre-trained networks. So you could take someone else's network and just grab their weights for the first few layers. And they probably learned something reasonable because they trained it on a lot of data. And you could just freeze those and, and keep, keep those layers. And it would probably do what you want. So um, I think that's a reasonable way of going about it. I don't really see people like forcing the filters to be certain things kind of by hand, necessarily. Extension? Uh, can we just force the sum to be 0 to in order to make it? Yeah, all of these things. The question is, can we force the sum to be 0? It turns out people get really good results by just 
throwing the network at their problem. And, and of course, a lot of the things you see in the news and stuff have tons and tons of training data. But I wouldn't recommend going down those routes. I would say use, a, use some pre-trained weights like in lab as your like main approach of, as your main alternative to just training the whole thing from scratch. Sam. Are there any other use cases for CNNs besides photo or video? Are there any other use cases besides photos and videos? Absolutely. So uh, for example, in the 1D case, you can have audio signals. Like I mentioned, use a 1D convnet. They're even used for language. So you can treat language as a 1D sequence. Like you have this word, and then this word, and then this word, and then this word. Because in the earlier courses, you probably saw like a bag of words representation of language. Uh, where you just count how many words are in the document, but then you're throwing away the order of the words, which is actually pretty useful. So you could use, I think you're going to talk about this in 575, but um, you can use convnets for, for that kind of thing as well. Yeah, anything that is, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, et cetera, dimensional signal, you can, you can use them. All right, so let us move on to these true false questions. So here is the first round. I'll give you one minute to just read them over on your own. OK, what is next? Using pre-trained networks. OK, so um, this is in the lab, so I just want to talk about it briefly. Um, in the lab, you loaded a pre-trained network and did all kinds of stuff with it. Um, I have our favorite image that you're probably very used to right now. So I've, I, I think this may be actually a different pre-trained network than the one you load in the lab, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so I can just load this up and um, predict on this Milad image what, what is it going to be. And its top three answers are it's 22% of a suit, 20% of a Windsor tie, and 16% of a military uniform. My point of showing you that is in the lab, you were doing something fancier than what I just did. In the lab, you were actually loading the pre-trained layer, chopping off its head, essentially putting a new head of some dense layers at the end, and then uh, retraining those. But even simpler than that is just running it right out of the box. I didn't touch anything. I just loaded it, those were the categories it was trained on, so those were the categories it was going to give me. And even that is a very useful thing, because sometimes maybe the task you're doing is actually the task that the pre-trained network was trained on, and then even better, you don't have to do anything. So don't feel like you have to mess with the pre-trained network to get value out of it. Sometimes, if you're lucky, um, you can just use it. So I, I ran it on, getting a little meta here, I ran it on this picture from the lecture, and it said it was a menu, a 60% probability. Um, so just to summarize the ways you can use pre-trained networks. Out of the box, that's what I just showed you. In fact, in the first cohort, uh, when one team was presenting their capstone project, someone asked what part of this project was harder than you expected and what part was easier than you expected. And the easier answer was very interesting. The student said, the partner wanted us to do sentiment analysis, and we thought that was going to be really hard and take us several weeks. But actually, it just took like a few hours. We just got some pre-trained sentiment analysis network and used it, and it was great. And so um, that's good to know, right? Because the people who trained that thing had way more data than the capstone partner did, especially way more labeled data. So you're just leveraging all of someone else's data to solve your similar problem. That's really useful. And for sentiment analysis, it's kind of learning like some type of words show that a person's happy, some type of words show that a person's unhappy. That's pretty transferable to what you might be doing. So you don't need to do it all from scratch. But then the fact that you can tweak it makes it all the more powerful, right? So if it's not perfect for what you're doing, fine. If, if, if their categories are different from your categories, or in fact, maybe they're doing classification and you're doing a regression, that's fine too, right? You can just keep most of the layers, as you did in lab, and just kind of tweak it at the end. Uh, and you can even change some of their weights. So in approach three in this week's lab, um, you're essentially initializing your stochastic gradient at the weights they already had. So you're there in parameter space. In approach two, you were kind of stuck there. In approach three, you allowed to move around a little bit and, and fine tune things. 
You can also use these pre-trained networks as a feature extractor. And I think that's an optional question on your lab, but um, you can just throw away the top layer and just say now this is just, you talked about feature engineering in, in 573, I believe, but you can just say this is a feature engineering pipeline. It transforms my original image into a thousand meaningless numbers. I don't know what they are, but it's a feature vector of length a thousand. I bet it's pretty good as, as features. It probably is pretty good as features, right? And so uh, I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's another thing you can do with these pre-trained networks. Any questions on that? Mm-hmm. For Ken? So when you use, like, say, some you know, that we do pre-trained network, yep. like, say, how much information you just override compared to what you begin with? What is that balance? What is the balance of how much, inf how much tweaking should you do? I mean, I guess you can, I'll in general always advocate for trying the simplest thing first and if it's not good enough going to the fancier thing. So like you saw in the lab, why not? Just or, try it out of the box even. If that's not good enough, throw away the top layer. If that's not good enough, you consider some tweaking. But just keep in mind, those people may have had not only crazy amounts of data but crazy amounts of GPUs and you maybe have one GPU and there's, you might not be able to do that much computation if you unfreeze too much of the network. So that could definitely be limiting you, but it's worth a try. Yeah, my like, say, question was more towards, like, say, if I do the changes, mm -hmm. and, uh, add the training on that model, then how much I'm changing the original training network compared to what I have? Yeah, how much are you training the original pre-trained network? Well, it, it depends how, how much you run your optimization for. I mean, if you run it for, like, one iteration, you're hardly changing it. Does this kind of depend on the number of parameters you already had versus um, the parameters you are adding? It, 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 I think I would say more it depends on how much, like how many epochs or how much optimization you do. And it also depends on how bad were those weights for your problem. Because if they're really, really wrong, you might get bigger gradients and more changes. And if they were kind of fine, they might not change at all. So that's what I would say. Okay, so about this feature extractor thing, I just wanted to show you, because in the lab it's an optional question and you, what I want to say is with this feature extractor thing, you can leave the entire neural networks world entirely. So um, I just trained this before. This is the same kind of MNIST convnet that you've already trained in your lab. Um, so that's all fine. It's too slow for me to do it right in front of you, but here it is. And then I have this syntax here. You have similar syntax in your lab. But I'm basically saying make me a new model that goes from the input to close to the end. And that's basically saying chop off the very end. And now I can treat this thing as a feature extractor. And the feature extractor takes 28 by 28 images and outputs feature vectors of length 50. And I just want to emphasize, I can do anything I want with those feature vectors of length 50. So here I've used that to transform my train and test. Um, but I could actually use a random forest on those transformed features. I, it doesn't have to be a neural network. So you can simply say that's a feature extractor. I'm going to do anything I want with it. And no, you can't do the like fine tuning thing exactly the same way here because it's not really neural networks anymore. You're not even using TensorFlow anymore. But I just want to point out the feature extractor can be very general purpose and you can do whatever you want with it. Questions? Okay, let's take the break and resume at 11.16. Okay, we are back in action. The next section is things I should have said earlier, just um, some things that for one reason or another didn't get covered until today um, for the last two weeks of the course. So one of them is the vanishing gradient problem. You can click on the link or read about it online. The thing is, we didn't really talk in this course about backpropagation and how you compute the gradient for neural networks and so on and so forth, but you should at least be aware that um, it is an application of the chain rule from calculus, essentially, and that you are chaining together these derivatives through the layers. And 
what can happen is that the chain rule is essentially meaning you're multiplying together a bunch of derivatives. And sometimes those derivatives can be small. And the vanishing gradient problem refers to the problem that you're multiplying a bunch of small numbers together. And especially when you use the sigmoid uh, activation function, if you think about a case where your activation before coming in here is very big or very small, then you're in a part of the activation function that's very flat. And the derivative is very small. Or over here, the derivative is very small. And so you can get these things of multiplying very small numbers. And, and, and there's, um, basically, you don't properly train the weights at the early layers um, because of this. So uh, good to be aware of this. And, and a good thing about ReLUs is they help with this issue. Um, they're still a little weird in that half of them are flat, but the other half um, is not, and, and so you don't have this problem of the derivative getting very small. Yes, Shivam. Uh, does tanH, hyperbolic tan also have this? Yeah, tan, to hyperbolic tan is, is pretty much the same thing as this. I mean, it, it's basically just a rescaling of this. So put it on your radar. You, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you should read more about it. Uh, the next thing is dropout. So we didn't really cover dropout other than whatever mention of it was in the videos. Um, but I did ask you about it on the lab. So just a one minute version is that it is a form of regularization. Uh, some things that we saw coming up in the lab this week. So dropout does not permanently drop parameters. It does not delete parameters. It just temporarily disables parameters during the training. And then they get re-enabled after the gradient update. Uh, and then during prediction, you actually use all the parameters. So uh, I, I have this dropout notebook that is in the, the repo if you want to look at it. I'm not going to go through it in detail right now. But the point is, you can actually use this for linear regression, which is what I did, linear regression with basis function. So if you really want to get into dropout, I think it's actually easier for you to digest it in this simpler context than in the neural network context. And long story short, um, I use regularization and get something smoother. And then I use dropout and also get something smoother. And so it actually behaves quite similarly to L2 regularization on this basis regression problem that has nothing to do with neural networks. So if you're interested, check that notebook out. If you're not, that's totally fine. Um, but just wanted to say that. And then also, um, there's a bunch of TensorFlow data sets that I just want to make you aware of. So if you're interested in this, you want to play around with whatever kind of nets on more problems, you can click on that link. There's a bunch of uh, data sets that are built into TensorFlow. The MNIST one is a really boring data set. Um, as you saw, it's not that hard to get very good accuracy. It's not that interesting. Um, but there's all kinds of data sets in there, audio, video, text, whatever. So um, feel free to check those out if you're interested. OK, next thing. So yeah, this is the part of the lecture where I'm just sort of spamming random things that I wish we had more time to talk about. So um, the next one is, is fit generator. So a very common problem is that your data set does not fit into memory. I would not be surprised if some of you encounter this in your capstone projects if you happen to be using deep learning in your capstone projects is you have a terabyte of images, and you're supposed to learn from that terabyte of images. And you can fit your a terabyte on disk, but you can't fit it into memory, at least on your machine. Maybe you can get some super high memory machine in the cloud and, and get it done. But often, you can't actually fit the data into memory. And so everything you've seen in the last six months was all about fitting into mem everything into memory. You would just load your x and y, and bam, you had them right there in Python. right? Your, your environment wasn't crashing and saying out of memory, hopefully. But that could easily happen. And the beauty of the situation is that stochastic gradient actually allows us to get around this problem. Because with stochastic gradient, you don't need all your n training examples in your possession at any given time. You can, if, you're, if you have a billion examples, you can just load 1,000 of them from disk into memory. That's your batch size, 1,000. Do the update. Because the thing is, you can fit the weights into memory. That's typically not the problem. The weight's going to be much smaller than the training data. So you can fit all the weights into memory, a bit of data, use that bit of data to update all the weights. 
trash that bit of data, load another thousand examples from disk, do another mini batch update. Um, and it's a super, super common thing. And I just, I don't want you to get stuck not knowing about this and saying, oh, I can't, it doesn't fit. I'm going to go home. So um, if you recall, we talked about generators in the algorithms course. One of the reasons I wanted to talk about generators in the algorithms course was precisely this. Um, so just to quickly refresh your memory, this function returns a list of, of powers of two. And this is a generator where I can grab the, the powers of two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two. And the point is with this generator, I don't need to store if I, uh, if I ever want a billion powers of two. Um, that's totally fine. There you go. So that's going to blow up my computer if I did it on the upper function because I cannot fit a list that big on my computer. Um, but here it's just fine. I can just, just keep going. And I'm only storing one number at a time, so it's all good. So it's, it's just the analogy with the mini batches, right? You have the, you're just grabbing one mini batch, grabbing another mini batch. You're only storing one mini batch at a time. <coughs> and so in tensorflow.keras, the function is called fit generator. So instead of dot fit, it's dot fit generator. And instead of giving it x and y, you give it a generator that will produce the next mini batch on command. And then it'll just take care of all of it for you. So most of it is taken care of for you. All you have to do is make the generator that returns a mini batch, uh, which isn't all that bad. So just a good thing to have on your radar for big data sets. Any questions about this? Anas. Uh, how do you read from the file, let's say, or from a directory? Yeah, so how do you read from the file? So with images, for example, often you'll just have like a billion or however many image files. And so it's not actually that hard because you can just read one training example by just reading one file. And so if you just want a thousand images, you'll just read a thousand of those image files and, and stick them together. Um, it's not going to be so good if your whole data set is one big file, because then if you try to read the whole file. So then you'll have to use some fancier file reading functions that can actually just read part of the file. Come on. Uh, and if it Yes. The number of images you're passing is going to be your batch size, exactly. Or it doesn't have to be images, but yeah, the number of training examples is is a is a batch typically. Shivan. Uh, does TensorFlow model save data along with it, like the model object? If you want to save it on disk, will that save the data itself? Or? Yeah, no. So when you save the model, and you may have seen that in the lab, I had a commented outline where you were saving the model. Yeah, that just saves the weights. It doesn't save all the data. Because the weights are all you need to make predictions. So the point of saving the weights is you want to deploy this somewhere. You just want to be able to make predictions. You don't need the data anymore. So in case of fit as well as fit generator, both of them, data is not saved? Correct. The data is not saved in the model object. OK, a bunch of random things about deep learning. So um, visualizing filters. So I've mentioned this briefly. It's just there seems to be an obsession with visualizing filters. It is kind of nice. You can see this in research papers and stuff. Hey, I trained this CNN. Look at the filters. They look like edge detectors. And people love to connect the whole neural network thing back to its origins with the brain and neuroscience. And so they'll say, oh, look. This is a type of filter used in the brain, like Gabor filters or whatever. And then these, look, the ones we learned are very similar to those. So um, yeah, people like to do this. It's fine with me. Um, next thing, famous architecture. So you, for example, just in the lab with the pre-trained network, I think we were loading a VGG net or a ResNet or something. So just so you know, every couple years, there, there's like, the thing that, that is the new architecture. And so it's, it's usually, when I say architecture, it's usually more than just this many layers and this many units. It's like they have some special sauce that, that makes it work better. Um, that's a little beyond what we've done in the course. But um, just keep an eye out. These, you know, 
they come and go. And um, so the, the most recent one, so BERT is super popular right now for natural language processing. I think you're going to talk about it in the advanced machine learning course 575. But um, yeah, there's, there's these famous architectures. And when you're loading, the weights and the architecture are different. So when we loaded the pre-trained thing in lab, it was whatever it was, a, a ResNet trained on the ImageNet data set. So try not to confuse those two things in your head. There's the architecture and then the data set it was trained on. And you should be aware of both of those things if you're using a pre-trained network because if the architecture is meant for language like BERT and you're doing videos, don't use BERT. It's not going to make sense. But then on top of that, actually look at the data set it was trained on because if the types of images are like completely different from the types of images you're using, like if you're working on satellite images and it was trained on pictures of dogs, it's probably not going to work. Just search for some, some pre-trained network that was trained on satellite images. Uh, that's going to be more effective. OK, so yeah, some historical stuff here. This whole frenzy of deep learning started in, in 2012 when this um, Alex character from University of Toronto um, got really good at, at programming GPUs, essentially. And so they, they named his architecture AlexNet. You may see that around. Uh, so data sets also come and go. There's, you know, MNIST is, is super, super out of date now, but everyone still talks about it. It's just like the classic data set. Um, but we can consider that a solved problem. Um, so then, I don't know, maybe five years ago, there was ImageNet that was really hard. It makes sense that it's hard, right? A thousand class classification is hard. Um, but the data sets will also come and go with the architectures. And so you may just want to have some vague awareness if you're working in this space of what are the currently hard data sets that people are working on. And it's very nice when people make data sets public because they put a crazy amount of work into labeling them, right? Think the labeling takes a lot of work because uh, humans are, are doing the labeling. So it's really great when people share data sets. It's not super great when people kind of overfit to certain data sets and the whole field just goes in a certain way that's over specialized for the currently popular data set. But um, overall, I think it's, it's a good thing that people are sharing these data sets. Uh, next thing, or maybe questions about stuff so far? OK, so next thing, pre-processing and initialization. These are just two things that people often get confused. So I just want to point out they're not the same thing. Pre-processing is how you deal with your x and y. So are you scaling your features? Are you wh whatever thing you might do? Um, so there's various pre-processing things people do. I mean, I would say scaling is definitely a good start for most problems that you might be working on. But then initialization is about the parameters, not about the data. So I'm going to randomly initialize my weights. You'll see some hyperparameters about that, like how big should the random numbers be, blah, blah, blah. Um, so just things to, to be on your radar of um, knobs that you can turn when you're working on a problem with deep learning. Yeah, so you can, you can look at the documentation. OK, so hyperparameter optimization. Um, is a huge hassle for deep learning. And I guess you've done some hyperparameter optimization in 573. If I understand correctly, you used randomized search, grid search, those types of things with scikit-learn. Yeah, so um, that's fine. Hyperparameter optimization is just a massive hassle when you have a lot of hyperparameters, which you do in neural networks, as we've discussed. Um, my one minute take on it is that I would almost always recommend using random search over grid search. Um, but that there's also these fancier methods that uh, maybe you saw in 573 or maybe not. So um, the thing about the random search and the grid search is they're not learning. So they might do a bunch of experiments with like a one layer neural network and they're all terrible. And you could probably figure out after a while that a one layer neural network is terrible and just sort of move on from that. So some of these fancier methods, there's a package called scikit optimize that has a Bayes search CV that's like modeled after randomized search CV. Um, they'll actually learn as they do the hyperparameter optimization and be like, 
oh, I've already tried out 20 different hyperparameter sets. It seems this is good. It seems this is bad. Let me try something that is more likely to be good. And so they're just a little more fancy and sophisticated. And when you're getting into the domain that each experiment takes five hours and you're paying a bunch of money to use a bunch of GPUs in the cloud or whatever, you start to care more about your hyperparameter search being a little more efficient because um, it, it could be quite useful. So just things to, to be aware of. Um, Autoencoders, we completely did not cover in this course. Um, in this case, you haven't taken unsupervised learning yet, so it's not even really worth going into this. But uh, basically, neural networks can be used for unsupervised learning. You haven't yet taken the course on unsupervised learning, but um, it's just worth knowing that almost all the neural network stuff is supervised learning. But there is some people doing unsupervised learning with neural networks. And you could, if you're working on an unsupervised problem, um, after taking the course with Rodolfo and everything, if you want to come back to this, just be aware there is some deep learning -y stuff in that space. Uh, but we don't really cover it in the course. OK, types of neural networks. So. You've seen dense, aka fully connected. You've seen convolutional, conv1D, conv2D, conv3D, et cetera. There's also recurrent neural networks. So you may have noticed in Keras, you were always doing sequential. And then you were either, either adding the dense layers or the convolutional layers, but it's still sequential, sequential, sequential. In the advanced machine learning course 575, you are going to have something other than sequential, which are these recurrent neural nets. And they're going to do great stuff for you um, in, say, natural language data and all those types of things. So stay tuned for the advanced machine learning course um, where you will talk about all the things. OK, next. GPUs and parallel processing. I know this is like light speed, very shallow, but I just want to get these things out there. Um, so you have now used a GPU. Um, in the cloud for, for the lab this week. You have hopefully seen, other than the, the people who already had GPUs in their laptops and didn't actually see a speed up, but for, for the rest of us, you probably saw a, a big speed up. You might see like five times speed up, say, from going from your CPU to, to one of these GPUs. Um, I won't go into this too much right now, but for those of you who've heard of Moore's Law, it was this idea that our processors kept getting better and better every year at this ridiculous exponential rate. And in the last, I don't know, 10 years, that hasn't really been happening anymore. And distributed and parallel computing is like the new thing and the way people are really pushing to bigger and faster computations. And so we actually did two things. We use the GPU, and the GPU is in the cloud. And those are separate, right? You could have a GPU on your local machine. You could have a CPU in the cloud. So in the web and cloud computing course in block six, you will do more cloud stuff. And that's just a whole big and really, really important subject. Um, because say you're doing hyperparameter optimization with randomized search CV, you can do, if you have 100 machines, you can do 100 things at the same time. Those have nothing to do with each other. They're independent experiments. So. Um, yeah, the cloud thing is really good, and the GPU thing is really good. Um, and they're both related to parallelization. Um, I guess that's all I really want to say. AI safety and adversarial examples. So You do have an ethics course coming, uh, the privacy, ethics, and security course. But that is three enormous topics, privacy, ethics, and security, all within four weeks. Um, so we can't cover everything in that course. But within the kind of security and safety, there's this like deep learning safety sub area, which I would like you to at least be aware of. Um, so I have a couple of links. Let me see if I can. So I linked to this blog post in this paper. Um, basically, 
someone took a reasonably good neural network, gave it this image, and then it was 57% confident that it was a panda. And then they added a imperceptible amount of noise and made it 99% confident that it was a gibbon. And you can make it think it's a toaster and a refrigerator. Like it's, the more you read into this, the more disturbed you're going to get about how fragile these deep learning systems are. If you did logistic regression on your problem and then you kind of messed with your inputs a tiny bit, you're probably not going to get a super confident, completely different output. And we kind of understand how logistic regression works, right? It's like this weighted sum. So I mean, I change my feature a little bit. I multiply that change by the weight. And I change my output a little bit. And it's all good. But no one really understands how these neural networks work. And they can do very weird stuff. And no, these people did not pick that imperceptible noise randomly. They actually used optimization to find the imperceptible noise that would most derail the predictions. But still, even the fact that this is possible is super messed up. And so this is, I don't know what, three years ago or something, this blog post. But um, this paper is more recent, and I, I link to it as well. So let me see if I can find the. Yeah, so, so basically what people are doing is um, making these stickers. And you can, you can look this up online as well, making these stickers. And they actually have a camera with a deep learning system hooked up to it. And they point the, the camera at the toaster. And it says the toaster. And then they stick the sticker next to the toaster. And it says it's something completely different, like a truck or whatever. And so these are the stuff from a few years ago. It's kind of cheating because the authors had access to the code and could optimize for the, the noise. And, and that's not a realistic scenario. But the newer things are even more disturbing. Because imagine a self-driving car using a CNN. And it sees a stop sign. But some evil person had just put a sticker on the stop sign. And now the car thinks it's a green light. That's very worrying. And again, it all comes down to the fact that no one really understands how these neural networks work. And I mean, sure, we know what it does. But there's so many layers and weights and weird things happening that we can't, we can't accurately understand what, if we change the input a little bit, how is that going to change the output? It's just too complicated. And so I do think, I think AI safety has a bad name because there's all these people talking about like those robot movies where the robots try to kill the humans. And I think that's actually very damaging because it takes away credibility from people talking about the real problems, which I think do exist, which are not conscious robots coming and killing all the humans, but more like technologies we don't understand intersected with nefarious humans who are trying to cause harm. And that's the more like uh, immediate thing that we're going to have to deal with. So um, who knows, right? I, I, it's, it's an important issue. Uh, people are working on this. People are trying to work on interpretability. I think interpretability is going to be a growing field within deep learning of like, well, how do we understand what these things are actually doing? And I, in the readme of the course, I've linked to some posts and articles about interpretability. You can check those out if you're interested as well. But um, it's, it's an interesting topic. Any questions or comments about all that? Yes, Aman. I have two questions. One is, how do we save our uh, deep learning models? Will it be the same as the or How do we save our deep learning model? So um, yeah, you, you can save them. It might not be a pickle, but it'll be some format. Um, in lab three, I actually have a little note about it somewhere. And I have the code commented out. But you, you can find that somewhere in, uh, sorry, in lab four. Yeah, you can save the weights to some kind of file and then load them again later. Okay. And, and second is the, the GPUs, we use them only for training and not for predictions. Oh, good question. Yeah, the, the question is GPUs, do we use them only for training and not for um, predictions? So here's the thing. Other than some weird stuff like k nearest neighbors, most of the time prediction is way faster than training. So it's more that prediction may be fast enough that we just don't really care. And so we use a CPU because why not? 
but yes, using a GPU for prediction is possible and it would be faster than using a CPU for prediction. It's just we might not care that much about it being fast. Oh, but, but in some applications you might too, it just depends on the problem. Anas. Oh, uh, real quick. Uh, is it possible to solve problems like these through ensembling like different deep learning models and like predict taking like the average from Ensembling different deep learning models. Um, you cannot, you can ensemble anything, it's just there's such a pain already. The hyperparameters, it's slow. Like the last thing you want to do is train and tune five neural networks instead of one. So sure you can, but I think you're going to find it unpleasant. And I just talked about dropout. There's some, there's a story with dropout that is kind of like ensembling a bunch of neural networks. Um, it's not exactly that, but it kind of has the flavor of that. So. Yes, there's nothing stopping you from doing it other than the, the inconvenience of doing it. Okay, four more minutes. So, um, what else didn't we cover in this course? Um, a whole bunch of things. Here's a list of them. Um, let me at least say two minutes worth of this last topic. You can read over this later. It is an important thing for you to think about. You're going to try something you learned in MDS and it's not going to work and the question is what next? And you have some tools to think about that. Am I overfitting? Am I underfitting? Do I have problems with the data? Do I have problems with the hyperparameters? Do I have problems with the model? Do I have not enough data? Do I have data quality problems? Um, do I have missing data problems? You talked about that today with Rodolfo, I know. So there's, I have below and you can refer to it later if you want, just a list of all the things that might be going wrong for you to think about. But for this course in particular, it's just there's this very important big thing to add to your list of what the problem might be, which is the optimization. Because now we had this non-convex loss, we had all this random SGD stuff. There's always this nagging feeling in the back of my mind that maybe everything's fine and I just need to run another 10 epochs and everything will be great. And there's no way of really knowing um, if, if that would be a good idea or not. So. Um, that is just a massive pain, at least for me, when I open this can of worms and start using deep learning because it's so hard to debug already and, and, and come up with better machine learning models and you just have this whole extra category of problem to deal with and it's pretty hard to figure out um, what problem it is you're dealing with. So I just wanted to say um, that that is another issue that you need to worry about when using deep learning. So what do I have here? Um, yeah, or maybe I'll just say this, like if you get 90% validation error on the problem, it may be that it is impossible to do better than 90% on that problem due to the nature of the problem. It's just there's too much randomness in the output. That's another frustration with all the supervised learning. You never know. Could, is there something better or maybe actually I've already reached the best thing that you can have and that's just there isn't really a way around that problem, but it is a frustration we have to deal with. Most of the time in real life, yes, you might be able to come up with something a bit better, but um, the fact that we never know how close we are to this unknown best possible model for the problem is an extra difficulty because we don't know how much effort and time and energy to spend trying to improve the model. So, well, that's, that's just the way it is. Uh, loss functions, speed. Uh, optimization and, and, and that's it. We're pretty much out of time. So this is the end of the course. This is my last lecture in the program, but I will be uh, the lab instructor for the Bayesian inference course next block. So I will see you all then and I will see you all in capstone.